Well, good morning. It's good to have you in chapel this morning. It is time for us to praise the Lord together. Allow me to lead us in that. And if you know the words, go ahead and sing along as, uh, as I share this next song. All creatures of our God and King. Up, just up a little more, Benin. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. Hallelujah, hallelujah.
All that with yonder sacred throng we as his feet may fall will join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. Do the flash to life. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. How long, how long is the Lord faithful? Be reminded this morning. Our God is faithful forever, so let's sing of our thanks to Him for His faithfulness. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King, His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things, His love endures forever. Sing praise. The mighty hand and an outstretched arm is love and forever. That's been reborn, it's love and forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. From the rising to the setting sun, let's sing. From the rising to the setting sun, His love endures forever. And by the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever and ever, forever. Amen. Amen. Oh, he truly is faithful forever. He's been so faithful to us. Don't you just wish you could crown him king of everything? I mean, wouldn't you like to make him king of Greece during the Olympics and king of all those Islamic countries so that they would see God in his glory and know Jesus as he is? Wouldn't it just be great if we could put that crown for him over all? Well, the reality is we can crown him king over all in our hearts and lives. Have you put his crown over your computer so that nothing will cross that screen that doesn't give glory to God? 
and reflect His holy character? Have you put His crown over your watch so the way you spend your time today and every day is going to reflect His priority in your life? Have you put His crown over your habits? Not just the habits of study and seminary, but the habits of your play and your recreation and your entertainment. You may not be able to put His crown over all the world. He'll handle that but you can put His crown over all of you. And that's one reason He's brought you to seminary, to challenge you to take that crown and let it reign over every nook and cranny of your life. I'm going to ask Dr. Alan England to come and join me here on the platform to lead us in a word of prayer. Dr. England is one of our new professors joining our faculty this fall. He comes to us from Clear Creek College in Kentucky. He's going to be teaching in the Christian education area and serving as our uh, J.M. Frost Chair of Christian Education, our liaison with LifeWay. We're delighted to have him here with us. Dr. England, would you please come? Lead us in a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for who you are in our life, Father. We just thank you for the opportunity to come here today, Father, just to uh, lift up praises to you, Father, to worship you. And Father, we pray that what we have done here today will be pleasing to you. And Father, as we leave here, here after the service, that we would go out we will take care of your business and your way. And, Father, we will, we will bring glory to you by the way we live our lives. Thank you again for your love. Most of all, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Before you sit down, turn to somebody near you and just remind them, don't just polish his crown, put it over everything. Would you do that? Well, all right. We'll let you sit down for about five, ten. We want to welcome you to chapel. Uh, you know, we've uh, some of us have been around here for a little while. Uh, I think I was born here now. Uh, I've just been here a while. But um, some things we recognize about chapel. One is that uh, chapel attendance fluctuates. Isn't that right, Dr. Shattuck? Um, we're glad to have you here. It would be good if uh, you wanted to worship uh, the Lord with us uh, every day that we meet here for chapel. We know that's not possible for everyone, but we do meet here and practice, hear me, we practice what we're going to be doing the rest of our eternity anyway, and that's worshiping our Heavenly Father. And so we'd love to have you come for rehearsal, and uh, that will be every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and we'll attempt uh, many different kinds of things. Sometimes the band will be rehearsing, won't we, folks? Amen. This is uh, this was our first rehearsal, what we just went through, and so I was glad for a good rehearsal. We'll see how this next one goes. But we want to join together and sing what we believe about the Lord to the world. And so let's join together as we sing this next song. Let's stand together as we sing. Ready? <laughs> Echo after me. We believe in love of Father. We believe in Christ the Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We are the church and we stand as one. Let's praise Him together. Holy, holy, holy. God, worthy, worthy, worthy is God. All glory and honor are His to receive, to see the sweet thing, because we We believe in the Holy Bible. Let the world hear it. We believe in the virgin birth. Amen. We believe in the resurrection. 
that Christ one day will return to us. Let him hear it. Holy, holy, holy is our God. Worthy, worthy, worthy is our King. All glory and honor are His to receive. Let the world hear this. We believe in the blood of Jesus. We believe in eternal life. We believe in the blood that frees us to become the bride of Christ. Holy sing together. Holy, holy. Let's sing. Holy, holy. Holy is our God. He is worthy, worthy. Worthy is our King. All glory and honor are His to receive. We sing together the hymn of heaven, hallelujah, hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns, joining with all of creation as we join as we sing together.
your Bibles, please open them to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. We'll get there eventually, but not immediately. This is not going to be a sermon. This is rather going to be a look, a perspective at where we've been and where we are. And what God has been doing in this place, this school of providence and prayer, and what has been happening in the larger Southern Baptist Convention. I thought the best way to begin our year is with that bird's eye view of where we've been and where we are. We'll begin by looking at our school and what God has been up to. We'll look at our faculty changes. If you were here in chapel in 1996 as we kicked off the academic year, we would have had 48 trustee elected faculty members. We now have 64 trustee elected faculty members. If you would have been a student uh, in 1996, you would have been one of almost 1,900 students gathering on the campus of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. Last year, we finished the year with more than 3,800 students, doubling in enrollment in about eight years. Our on-campus enrollment alone uh, is larger than our total enrollment eight years ago. But it's just not enrollment. We've also been seeing some changes in our facilities on this beautiful old campus, uh, old getting worn out, but still beautiful. We're trying to improve it and bring it into the 21st century. Some of the projects that have taken place in the last several years include a complete renovation of the Bunyan Building, and you see classrooms now like our pastoral ministries classroom that actually has a baptistry, a Lord's Supper table, so you won't have to drown somebody in your first church. We'll actually teach you how to baptize while you're here. And we're trying to equip all of our classrooms with the tools to prepare them for the 21st century. We also have been working on our housing facilities, and uh, we have housing for missionary groups that come now. We built a new dormitory, the Price Center, just for groups that come to New Orleans to help us tell New Orleans about Jesus. This last summer alone, we had nearly 2,000 teenagers and their sponsors who came to scatter out all over the city and tell the people of New Orleans about Jesus. And they'll be coming through here, high school students, college students, and your senior adult groups will be coming through all year long to help us tell the people of New Orleans about Jesus Christ. But it's not just missionary housing for those who come to help us tell. We've also been working on our faculty homes. This is Dr. Leo Day's home. And uh, this was the favorite picture of our maintenance division because it was the last house torn down in our phase one of faculty rebuilding with all the cracked slabs and all the mold and air conditioner problems and all the other things that were wrong with them. The Lord has enabled us to tear down and rebuild 28 faculty homes, and the new ones look a little different, and our faculty are grateful about that as we've been improving that housing for faculty. But not just for faculty, we've also been working on our student housing. We've built three buildings of four-bedroom apartments called the Manor Apartments for our families with multiple children. Uh, We've also gone into Farnsworth, which was also housing for families with multiple children, and we left the walls and we left the floor. Everything else we tore out and made different in renovating Farnsworth. We've also been working in Hardin Student Center, and we're beginning the work of going through that entire facility to renovate it. Our first stop was the business office. My favorite was there at the business office, right behind the cashier's window, we had this large stain that looked like they had sacrificed a student and the blood was still there in the carpet. And so now we've been able to renovate that, and the next up in that building will be the Dean of Students and Registrar's Office area. We're at work right now on new housing for singles, the kind of housing we've never had before. It will be four private bedrooms for each student to have a private bedroom around a common kitchen and living area, and that's uh, they're tearing along on it and should have it ready for singles to occupy in January. In addition to that, we're building a building next to the Hardin Student Center. We've completely run out of space in that building. It will be called the William Carey Building on the ground floor. It will house the William Carey School of Nursing from William Carey College in Mississippi. And then on the top floor, we'll have our radio station moving in from Hardin Student Center, our mission lab program, and a new conference center that we will uh, enjoy in many different ways. Then the Willingham Quadrangle, right behind Willingham Dorm, uh, there will be a brand new family recreation area. It will open in just a few weeks. They're working uh, on it right now, installing the equipment. There'll be a walking track around the whole quadrangle. There'll be a new playground for children in the quadrangle. There'll be about two or three picnic areas for families. There'll be a sand volleyball pit for those who want to prepare for the New Orleans Baptist Seminary Sand Volleyball Olympic team. And then we'll have a half-court basketball for those who want to play basketball when the 
uh, gym is closed and there'll be exercise stations all along the walking path. Should be opening in just a few weeks. And then Ham Hall across the street, uh, new housing for our guests who come, students who come from out of town for our one-week academic workshops, and other friends in the seminary who are coming through. We've torn down most of that in phase one renovation, built a new building with 59 new rooms. Hampton Inn kind of quality. We're very excited about that. A lot of good things happening with the facilities. But then also the programs have been changed. And up next, I should say, what's on the list now, we're planning new two-bedroom apartments to replace the state building apartments and then some new housing for our staff. But in addition to all the work on the building and facilities, we've also been working on the programs of the seminary. We've created a lot of new degrees. We've completely gone through every single degree we've offered, and we've asked, how does this need to change for the 21st century? We started by asking the question, what do students need to know and be able to do the day they walk in the door to serve a Southern Baptist church? We identified seven basic competencies everybody in ministry needs to have, and then we've literally built our academic programs from those competencies. And God is doing some wonderful things. You just can't imagine the difference between the curriculum now and what it was. But one of the most exciting things is just a little snapshot I think you'll enjoy seeing. We have extension centers all over the southeast. The most unusual one is located in Angola State Penitentiary, the largest maximum security prison in the United States of America. They have a Southern Baptist warden who asked us to come into this prison known as the most bloody prison in the United States, famous for violence, famous for suicides and beatings, escape attempts, all of that. They asked us to come in almost 10 years ago and to start a training program for prisoners in whose life God was working and let PBS tell you what's happened in the last eight years. From time to time, we've reported here on prison ministries, typically run by outside visitors or chaplains. Today, a four-year Bible college inside an infamous prison that is turning inmates themselves into ministers with apparently dramatic results. Lucky Severson reports from Angola, Louisiana. There's an ironclad rule for inmates working the farm at the Louisiana State Penitentiary in Angola. If they get too close to the guards on horseback, the guards will shoot first and ask questions later. This is a maximum security prison, the biggest in the country, 5,200 inmates, 3,200 with life sentences. Hardly any place anywhere has so many men with a history of violence. The warden, Burl Kane. And I was getting called every week when I was first warden here. We had murdered, we had escaped, we had suicides, we had loss of hope. Major Paul Myers, an Angola correctional officer for 23 years. It's not uncommon for us to have multiple knife fights within a single day. Jerome Derricks is in for life, and there is no parole in Louisiana. But when I first came here, I was shaking like dice. <laughs> I didn't know which way to go. Listen to what they're saying now. I can now lay down at night and not worry about what my neighbor is going to do me or anything like that. This general humanity amongst one another, I think it uh, largely accounts for the peace we have within the Institute. The big change started with Warden Kane, who was frustrated at the lack of funding for rehabilitation and education programs. The warden, a Southern Baptist, says he was determined to add some value and a sense of moral responsibility to inmates' lives. So he brought in a nationally accredited four-year Bible college operated by the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary and funded mostly by private contributions. That culture spread throughout this prison, and that's when the violence decreased. There was moral rehabilitation, which is the only true rehabilitation there is. I can teach you to read and write, educate you, but if I don't change you morally or you don't change morally, you're still a criminal. In other words, when Bible students mingled with other prisoners, the culture of violence started to change. The prison reports that inmate violence is down 40%, and attacks against guards are way down. That doesn't mean that life at Angola is free of violence. Far from it. In February this year, one inmate brutally murdered another. But there are individual success stories, inmates who were nothing but trouble before. Carolina was one of them, a lifer for second-degree murder. 
he was, by all accounts, as mean as mean gets until he found God. The common belief, even among myself, was that if you were a Christian, you were a coward. There was a stigma attached to Christianity. That's no longer the case. Absolutely not. When I committed my life to Christ, I met Jesus, and I have no shame about that. But these are cons, and prison conversions are not always believable. Although the head of the Bible school, the Reverend John Robson, says you simply cannot con a con. Every inmate knows exactly the game that is being played by all of those around him. The Christian inmate here cannot play the hypocrisy game and get away with it. Therefore, when you obey the person Christ, school is not easy. Applicants must have a high school degree or an equivalent. The workload is heavy. Those who graduate become prison ministers throughout Angola's sprawling 18,000-acre compound. This is KLSP 91.7, the incarceration station. They evangelize by broadcasting uplifting music and sermons 24 hours a day on the prison's radio station. And they minister to those among them with the least hope. How did you enjoy the service the other day? Jerome Derricks, a murderer, now a minister, comforting men facing death. They are very much aware of what I'm in here for and how long I've been here. They can identify with me because they look at me as one of them. They will be more receptive of me because I'm in here with them than someone was to come off of the street and try to minister to them. Mm -hmm. Can't go on following his word. My name's Edric, and you can always come in here and see me at any time. Edric Thierry counsels inmates whose needs are often overwhelming, like dealing with the guilt when you're in prison and your mom or dad dies. Non-Christian inmates have complained to the ACLU that the warden has an agenda to proselytize and convert his captive audience to Christianity. But Edric graduated from the Bible school, and he's a Muslim who comforts some of the 40 or so other Muslims, as well as Christians. You want, you want to pray? Sure. And people just need comfort where they are, no matter who they are. And I'm going to do the best service I can for him even if he is a Christian. We noticed, you know, Warden Cain then decided if missionaries could spread the good word at Angola, why not other prisons? We'll have missionaries and we'll support them and we'll give them $50 a month and then they can go work for the chaplain. Now Angola is transferring some of the school's 90 graduates two by two to Louisiana satellite prisons on two-year missions. It's the first and only program of its kind. This is Ray Henry. When he agreed to leave Angola to come to the Dixon Correctional Center, he gave up his trustee status and some personal freedoms. He's doing 50 years for armed robbery, and he'll probably never get out. If I don't get out, I'm satisfied. I'm content. You know, being right here, ministering the word of God, and we thank you, Lord, for forgiving us. Lord, I come, Lord, thank you for my brother, Lord. I know how society sees us as prisoners, that we're no good, no count, and there's no good that can come out of here. But I say that's just a figment of their own imagination because there are good people in here that deserve a second chance. The second chance for most prisoners will not occur in this life. 90% of inmates who come to Angola die here. They realize that God is in control of their life. And so, therefore, the horrible thing they may have done, God would forgive them, but there's consequences of your behavior. So they just submitted themselves to, to his will. For those who might think that Angola has gone soft, it hasn't. Prison rules are still rigidly enforced. Break them and pay the consequences. Obey them, and life, even at Angola, may be worth living. For Religion and Ethics News Weekly, I'm Lucky Severson, Angola, Louisiana. To quote an ancient Hebrew expression, wow! I mean, that's what those guys are doing with their seminary education. Last year they led to Christ and baptized 85 other inmates. Can you imagine God making a maximum security prison a missionary agency? sending out missionaries. When we have our next graduation in May, 
from Angola, we'll have enough graduates to send at least two prisoners to every prison in the state of Louisiana. That's the kind of thing that God is doing through this school of providence and prayer. But the story is about not just what's happening here. After all, the real story is what's happening when you finish and what's happening in our churches and the mission of Southern Baptists across the United States and the world. Meanwhile, out on the church field, what's been going on these last several years? If you come over to New Orleans Seminary very often, you hear us say a very important statement. Seventy percent of our churches are plateaued or declining. So the Level Center uh, of Evangelism and Church Health, with Dr. Bill Day's leadership, undertook a study of what's really happening in our churches. Dr. Day, who's been for several years the Associate Director of the Center, working with some of our research students, started taking apart what's really going on in Southern Baptist churches. Is there any change in the number of plateaued and declining churches? Let's take a look at the study. On our website, you'll see it still. 70% of our churches are plateaued or declining. But let's ask that question. Has there been any change in the number of plateaued and declining churches in the Southern Baptist Convention? Here's what the Level Center has discovered. First of all, let's look at our definitions. There are, these are the most frequently used definitions for what is a growing church, a declining church, a plateaued church. The ones most commonly used, and we'll use these for the purposes of our study. A growing church is one that increases at least 10% in total membership over five years. A declining church is one that decreases at least 10% over five years. A plateaued church is one that is neither growing nor declining. Now, using those definitions, let's look at the 42,000 Southern Baptist churches. The Sunday School Board, as it was called several years ago, did a study from 1978 to 1983, a five-year period, and they discovered that 30.5% of Southern Baptist churches were growing, but 51.9% were plateaued, the same size as they had been for a long time, and 17.6% were declining. Well, what's happened since 1983? And that's what started me on my understanding, that study started me on my understanding of what was happening in Southern Baptist life. Since then, the uh, Sunday School Board updated their study. They went from 1985 through 1993, and they discovered that growing churches went from 30.2 to 32.7 percent of SBC churches. A small change, but a little positive. Plateau churches went from 51 to 47.9 percent of our churches. Declining churches went from 18 percent to 19 percent of our churches. Very small changes. The North American Mission Board picked up the study after that, and from 1994 through 2002, they looked at five-year blocks, and they discovered that growing churches went from 33.1% back down to 32.5%, plateau churches from 44.2% to 42%, and then declining churches from 22.7% to 24.7% of all of our churches. The Level Center picked up the study from that point. From 1998 to 2003, what's happened in the last five years? 30.3% of all Southern Baptist churches are growing. 45.8% of all Southern Baptist churches are plateaued. 23.9% are declining. The disturbing thing is that from 1983, when we had 17.6% of our churches declining, we've now gone in 2003, 20 years later, to 23.9% of our churches being in decline. 6% more of our churches have started to decline. The conclusion of the last 20 years has been virtually no change in Southern Baptist rates of church growth. We still have about 70% of our churches that are plateaued or declining. No change in that 20-year period. But there are some bright spots. There are some churches out there that really are growing and showing us it is possible in this nation, in this day and time, to reach people for Christ and to grow as a church. First Baptist Orlando has grown 24.9%. First Baptist Church Spartanburg has grown 34.3%. First Baptist, excuse me, Prestonwood Baptist Church, our recent Southern Baptist Convention President's Church, has grown 45%. First Baptist Woodstock with Dr. Johnny Hunt has grown 45.5%. Franklin Avenue Baptist Church, our own church just a few blocks away from the seminary campus, their pastor will be here in just a few days. 
to preach for us in chapel have grown 48% from 5,000 members to 7,000 members. Fellowship Church in Grapevine, Texas has grown from 6,000 to 18,000, a 171.9% increase. That's not too shabby. But their church is doing even better than that. Look at the really fast-growing ones. The Fellowship Church in Woodlands, Texas, from 1,900 to 6,800 members, a 255% growth rate. St. Mark's Missionary Church, from 694 people to 6,000 members, a 764% growth rate. Bay Area Fellowship, from only 107 people to 1,000 members, an 834% growth rate. Voices of Faith in Stone Mountain, Georgia, 150 people to 3,567 members, a 2,278% growth rate. Stonegate Church in Midland, Texas, from 40 people to 1,289 members, a 3,122.6% growth rate. Yes, there are churches out there growing. It is possible in this day and time to have a growing church. And in that list of about 10 churches, there were traditional churches, there were churches that were church plants started in a non-traditional format, there were blended churches, all kinds of churches. There are churches out there growing. However, reality check, the good news of 30% of our churches growing is really not that good. Let's go inside that 30% growth number. The problem we have is with the way we define it, using just a growth in total membership. Here's the reality. 1,409 churches in the growing category reported no baptisms in 2003. After you exclude those who reported no baptisms, you still have left in the growing church category churches with a baptismal ratio. How many, bapti how many church members per baptism with over 1,146 members per one baptism. That's not making a dent on the pagan pool. That's shuffling Baptists from one church to another church. Dr. Day has proposed a new definition for a healthy, growing church. Keep the old standard, 10% total membership growth over five years, but to that standard, add these qualifications. At least one baptism for the first and last years of the study. A member to baptism ratio of 35 members for every one baptism in the final year of the study. And then a conversion growth of at least 25% of the total growth. So that when you look at the total membership growth, 25% of it came from lost people who were saved and baptized in the church. Now let's go back to our 30% of growing churches and apply that definition to the statistic. 10% growth, 30.3%. If you add that qualification, at least one baptism in the first year and the last year of the study, that 30% drops to 23.5%. If you add that qualification of a member to baptism ratio of 35 members or less for every one baptism, it drops down to 11.9% are growing. If you add the qualification that 25% of the growth is conversion growth, it drops down to only 11% of our 42,000 churches. In other words, how many of our churches are plateaued or declining? 89% of all SBC churches are plateaued are declining. And what we are seeing right now out on the field, the field that you are preparing to serve, is that the passion of Southern Baptists for reaching the lost people for Christ is fading. When it's affecting 89% of all Southern Baptist churches, it's fading everywhere. It's fading from the men in the pulpit. It's fading from the Sunday school and small group ministry of the church. It's fading from those who are doing counseling and helping people with their problems. It's fading from those who are doing music. 
It's fading in every area of the church, even those who are working with children. That focus on the necessity of people to be born again through faith in Jesus Christ is fading in Southern Baptist life. And God has called you out at this point in space and time to do something that has never happened before. For the truth of the matter is, that story is a very common story. Every denomination in the history of America has grown, has then plateaued, and has then shifted into decline. No denomination has ever survived the growth of the Southern Baptist Convention. But do you think that is a necessity? Do you think that is the way that it has to be? I believe that God is capable of doing a great and mighty work such as this nation has ever seen. And I think He can do it with you. As a matter of fact, when we think about what's been happening in our seminary, I think these great things that we have seen, God's been using for a particular purpose. Next slide, please. We have a problem, and there's no doubt about that. But what is God trying to say to us in the midst of this problem? God has not been at work to build up our school and all these incredible miracles. And I got a miracle for everything you saw happening at this school. Every building project, I got a miracle story that God did. God has not been working to build up our school. He has been working to build up our faith and letting us see in bite-sized pieces the kind of things that He is capable of doing. As Jesus took the disciples from the shore of the Sea of Galilee and did miracle after miracle, taught them lesson after lesson, over three years, building them to the point where they could finally understand the implications of the Gospel, God is trying to do that with us. He's not trying to build up this school. He's trying to build up our faith. And do you know what really matters? Look at this next slide. There is a golden rule that cryptanalysts and code breakers always follow. Namely, every secret message can be deciphered. Every code can be broken, provided one knows that it's a message. What matters is not what the world believes about God. What matters is not what other people believe about the Bible. What matters is what do you believe? Do you believe that God has a strategy to lead Southern Baptists into a brand new chapter of our history. Do you believe that old plateau declining downtown First Baptist churches can learn to grow again? Do you believe that God can send fresh life and fresh vitality to any church in this nation? Do you believe that God is capable of doing something even though we haven't seen Him do it before? Do you believe? Because if you don't start with that assumption, you will never be able to recognize the things God wants to teach us in order for that great work to happen. Next slide. The challenge that we are facing is both simple and complex. Next slide. Those who live inside a miracle tend to lose their focus. Your Bibles, I ask you to open to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, the disciples have already seen amazing things. They have seen Jesus healing the sick, all kinds of sickness and diseases. They have seen Jesus cast out demons. They have seen Jesus in the midst of an angry storm when they were in the middle of the Sea of Galilee about to sink. Say a word and completely stop the wind and the rain. They have seen Jesus commission them and send them out, and they saw the power of God work in their lives as it did through Jesus when they went out and did ministry two by two. They then, most recently in the first part of Mark chapter 6, they saw Jesus feed 5,000 people with one little boy's sack lunch. To quote an ancient Hebrew expression, huh? Wow! That's pretty impressive. That's amazing. And after they saw that incredible miracle, on top of all these other things that they had seen, 
Jesus sent them to the other side of the Sea of Galilee while He went up in the mountain to pray for a bit longer. As they were going across the sea, the wind came up. They began to have more and more difficult times. And Jesus finally decided to go to them. And He came walking across the water to them. For for Jesus, water is a sidewalk as solid as concrete. And as He came walking across the water to them, they were terrified. And the Bible tells us in Mark chapter 6, verses 51 and 52, that when they saw Jesus coming across the water, they were terrified. And it says, they did not learn anything from the feeding of the 5,000. Instead, their hearts were hardened. You would think living inside a miracle guarantees that you will have the faith to believe that God can do anything. That is not true. Those who live inside a miracle tend to lose their focus. There are five big dangers that happen for those who live inside a miracle that will take you away from a focus on what God is attempting to do. Number one is relationships. As we begin to learn how much we irritate each other. And the longer you live with that guy down the hall in the dorm and the more you hear the sounds of footprints running across the ceiling of your apartment late at night, and the longer you're around each other, and the more you think about how hard that professor's test is and why doesn't he ever give you a break, the more we tend to irritate each other. And out of broken relationships comes a broken mission. What were the disciples arguing about when Jesus came in for the Last Supper? They were arguing about who was the greatest in the kingdom. They weren't there as a unity. They were there in brokenness. Another problem is distractions. There's always stuff going on. And Jesus constantly saw His disciples. Instead of hanging on His every word, they were always worried. Peter was worried, where are we going to get the tax that we have to pay when we enter the city? They were worried about where they were going to get the food to feed those 5,000 people. And after 5,000 were fed, where are we going to get the food to feed 4,000 people? They were always worried about logistics. Distractions are a necessity. They will come up in everybody's day. Do you let those distractions pull you away from what God is up to? Complacency. That sense of not understanding with awe and wonder that God controls the agenda and it's what He wants to do that will happen. So we have the disciples in the midst of Jesus' ministry coming with their moms to ask Him to make them great in the kingdom of God. They still didn't know the cross was going to happen. They had no clue about the resurrection. But they were already wanting to jockey for position for reward in heaven. Complacency about what God is doing. Temptation is always there. And while you're a seminary student engaged in more intense study of the Word of God and the things of God and giving more thought to your life as a Christian and your life as a minister than you've ever had before in your whole life, you'll have some of your greatest temptations to sin. Internet pornography will suck you in and destroy you if you give it half a chance at all. The temptation to cheat on a test or cheat on a paper because you were tired or because you had to work and you didn't get it done and you want a higher grade than you think you could make if you did it without cheating. All this and more Satan will use to tempt you and destroy your character while you're here. Compromise. When Jesus said He was headed to Jerusalem there to die, Peter pulled Him aside and said, No, you don't want to do that. Let me tell you what you want to do. And our willingness to compromise what God is up to. I will tell you that we are living inside a miracle right here at New Orleans Baptist Seminary. The things that we are seeing God happen defy description. Can you imagine a warden coming up with an idea to send missionaries out on maximum security prison? Can you imagine the city of New Orleans being home to the largest Baptist seminary in the world? Can you imagine God doing the things that He's doing? But He's not trying to build up our school. He's trying to build up our faith, our willingness and openness to believe the great work that He wants to do. And all that we have seen is just the baby steps that God is undertaking to get us ready for something great, something that can be a tremendous movement of God, something that can accomplish what has never been accomplished before. 
But will we let those dangers sidetrack us? God tells us the solution in His Word. It's a passage you all know very well. Many of you could quote it from your heart. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. Are you convinced that our land is broken and needs healing? Do you really believe that? Or are you just fine with things the way they are? If you're convinced that our land needs healing, if you know that things are broken, then it all starts with me. It all starts with you. And the condition of our own hearts before God. That's why we'll be emphasizing this whole year our core value of spiritual vitality. It's not enough to have right information in your head about God if your heart is cold towards Him. Did you ever notice what followed? Second Chronicles 7.14 God said, Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is offered in this place. God is wondering, does He finally have a seminary whose faculty and whose students will so submit themselves to Him that He can do a great work? Does He finally have one that is qualified, that is ready that meets His criteria for releasing a great and mighty work. God is able and God is willing. But the question is, are we available? I close with this. Greatness is not for the faint-hearted. Nor is it for the vain or the greedy. The path to greatness will of necessity run the gauntlet of uncertain outcomes, risk of that which one holds precious, and sacrifice at a level inconceivable to the ordinary life. Greatness is reserved for the hungry. Those who are so hungry for an outcome or a result that to fail in an attempt to achieve it is far more desirable than to live an ordinary, comfortable life. Every organization, group, society, or culture is doomed to stagnation unless there are those in its number who are willing to embrace the unknown cost of hunger for the possibility of a worthy greatness. It is those flashes of greatness that can be produced by the intensely hungry that can move the whole of ordinary to another level, that can take a people where they are and put them someplace else. The Southern Baptist Convention, its churches and people, and those millions that we are seeking to reach for Christ are in desperate need for a particular kind of greatness. They're not looking for the greatness of individual human achievement, but the spiritual greatness of a movement of God that will give birth to passion, to effective strategies, to giving and to serving. Why not let the beginning of that greatness break out here? The Bible tells us how the Lord has shown us the possibility. The cold reality is that the only hindrance to greatness is the hindrance of my heart and yours. Make no mistake about it. If that greatness breaks out, there will be a price to pay. 
Look at the life of the great athletes in the Olympics and the price they pay every day for physical greatness and understand there will be a price for participation in a great movement of God. But I will tell you, my heart hungers for that greatness. To be one small part of a mighty work of God. Will there be any who will join me in putting the whole of your heart on the altar of sacrifice and holiness that God might fully do what He is able to do. The world is waiting to see. Would you join me for a word of prayer? Father, we stand in awe before You. I, I just don't know words to describe what You have done in this place already. This is not a place where Baptists should thrive. It's not a place that anybody should want to come with an evangelical Christian heart. This is such a hard city. It's such a tough place. Father, You have been doing great things here. You've done miracles to make change possible in the curriculum and the way we're teaching. You've done miracles to enable us to begin slowly rebuilding this campus. You have done miracles in places like Angola. Father, You're just teasing us with the greatness of what can be but, oh, Father, may we never forget. You're not trying to build a seminary. You're trying to build our faith. What matters to You is not the story of this school. What matters is the story of what this student body and these faculty members can accomplish. What matters to You is the revitalization of churches that have long ago forgotten how to evangelize and reach people. What matters to you is the starting of new churches where nobody's ever heard of Baptist before. What matters to you is that all those who are lost will hear the name of Jesus and know of His great sacrifice and offer of salvation. Oh God, dear precious God, make us hungry for what You long to do. Make us so hungry we will pay any price to be a small part of a great movement of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.